Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon this evening is based on the passion narrative just read, what the Savior endured in the Garden of Gethsemane. You will see that God has so focused his love for all mankind in this garden in order to prove his perfect mercy and care to be yours. Again, the evangelists write, Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted hither with his disciples. And Jesus saith to them, Sit ye here, while I go over there and pray. So far the text, let us pray. Lord Jesus, bless thy word, that we may trust in thee. Amen. There is almost no more amazing garden than the garden of a retired Montana farmer. When I was a pastor in the rural West, I was often delighted to see what older men in town could make happen in their backyards. Some details about Montana farming will help explain the kinds of sights I saw. The part of Montana I lived in got eight inches of rain a year in a good year. Eight inches. How do you farm? You have to irrigate all the time. Throughout the valley, there was an intricate network of ditches to bring water along the side of your field. Then the farmer had the job of getting that water out over his crops. That meant daily chores like submerging siphon tubes along a ditch to pull water over the field. If it wasn't siphon tubes, there were PVC pipes set out all over the place, just right. And you had to open and close small windows across the line depending on where the water was needed that day. Then, once the water came out onto the crops, it flowed down little ditches that ran along the entire crop line. The farmer would often be out with a shovel, adjusting these tiny trenches so that each plant got the right amount of water. This was labor-intensive irrigation. For decades, the Montana farmer would spend his days adjusting pipe, setting siphon tubes, unclogging jams, making the tiniest adjustments throughout his field for decades until it was time to retire. Retirement was never his choice. His family convinced him it was time or forced him to leave the farm and move to town. And how many of these farmers then filled their long summers was with gardening. Gardening became, by default, their retirement plan. It was these small gardens cared for by veteran farmers with all day on their hands that amazed me so. You see, the farmer exchanged hundreds of acres for a six by eight foot plot of land in their backyard. The size of their field had changed drastically, but none of their zeal or love for their work had changed one bit. So all that effort and time that had once been devoted to vast tracts of land was now put into one small garden plot. You should see these gardens. Maybe you turn a sprinkler on yours and walk away. No, not these men. That would be the easy way. Instead, they dig countless tiny ditches throughout their garden, carrying water from one plant to another in an intricate little maze. Other men lay down pipe, not the huge pipes of the field, but tiny pipe, 
about a half inch in diameter, and would have the water flow perfectly, such that each plant had its own drip of water. Each drop perfectly timed, so that it received exactly what it needed. It was a marvel to behold. Such attention to detail focused in one small place. Why all this work? Because none of their passion and love had disappeared. They just had no other option left than their little garden. Although all that attention and care was amazing to see, there was a bit of longing behind it all. You see, the driving force behind all that retired farmer's garden work was his sorrow that he'd much rather be putting all his care into a far bigger field. This evening, Jesus and his disciples enter a garden. And in order for you to gain an understanding of what happened in Jesus' garden, I'd like you to think about those retired Montana farmers and theirs. Because in the Garden of Gethsemane, you see all of God's love, care, and attention for you put into one small plot of land. Now, just like the retired farmer, God would rather work a bigger field than Gethsemane. Oh, he has. He created the world and intended it to be a wondrous and vast expanse for you to live in. But by Adam and Eve's first transgression, sin has entered and corrupted everything. Since that point on, what God intended only to be good has been ruined and tainted by our misdeeds. God created the earth to be perfect, a gift for you. And the crop he meant to come forth from your enjoyment of it was your love for him and one another. But we have replaced this instead with anger, discontentment, destruction, and waste. The harvest of our depraved hearts. Now, despite our ill behavior, God still labors tirelessly among us. He showers you with his love, feeds you, and gives you all you have. And he has sent forth his word in an earnest attempt to wake us up and call us back to him. Throughout human history, he has sent his prophets to remind us again and again that he is God, not we ourselves that he is to be worshipped, that this is his creation, not ours. But what do we do in this fallen field? We think little of him, gladly following our will instead of his, our ways, our plans, our agendas. And when we don't get what we want, we take it out on each other and him. By all this, we have not so gently pushed our Creator to the side, casually beckoning Him to leave His pasture, that His work here is done. Like the Montana farmer slowly convinced to take a back seat, sell the farm, and settle into a neglected retirement. Well, when that Montana farmer is forced to retire, he's not happy about it. So too your God does not take this, your disregard for him and his care, very lightly. When you sin, you tell God you can do whatever you like with what he's given. When you hurt your neighbor, you show God you have no real, real need for him. When you think your ways are better than his, you suggest that God retire, that his work and labor are needed no more. What we deserve for this is God's wrath to be cast from this creation and his love forever. 
But the mystery of God's grace is that he has not given up on you. Now you have shown that his daily care for you can never change your heart. Your sins have forced him into a retirement of sorts. But since his boundless love has not changed one bit, he has set out with the most amazing of retirement plans. For tonight you see that he has taken his perfect love and care for all mankind, all that effort and time he would like the world to know, and he has focused it instead into one small garden. Gethsemane. I said earlier, there's almost no more amazing garden than that of a retired farmer. Almost. Because no garden can compare to the one Jesus entered the night in which he was betrayed. He told his disciples, sit ye here while I go over there and pray. In this garden, the love of God is manifested in the most intricately detailed of ways. For as the Son of God knelt in prayer, you see Jesus receive each of your sins as his own. Jesus once said that God cares for you so much that the very hairs of your head are all numbered. God also knows each of your transgressions, the ones you're very well aware of, the ones you'll never know. But were God to empty his rightful wrath upon you, it wouldn't solve anything. So instead of letting his wrath flow out as it should, he has carefully redirected every bit of it onto your Savior. Forced from what he would rather be doing, the retired Montana farmer puts all his care into delicately taking water throughout his garden. God the Father has done the same in this garden, only with your sins, delicately redirecting them all away from you to Jesus by the power of his word. The word which says, we have turned every one to his own way, but the Lord hath laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all. This is labor-intensive salvation. And you may be assured that the Savior's work on your behalf is full and complete, precise in every detail. For God's forgiveness now flows upon you by virtue of your Savior's anguish, by each drip of his bloody sweat, each drop perfectly timed, so that you receive all you need for eternal life. Yes, a retired Montana farmer can have some pretty neat gardens, but your Creator tends a far more glorious one. Look here at Gethsemane, and you will see care and attention unparalleled. Jesus, God's Son, prepared as the perfect sacrifice with you and all you have done your whole life through, clearly in mind, with a delicate care that only the God of love could accomplish. It's a marvel to behold such attention to detail focused in just one place. Why all this work? Because your sins have changed none of God's passion and love. You just left him with no other option than this garden. 
Here Jesus bears your sins, but also all their consequences, right up until his final words, it is finished. At which point, he's buried in another small plot of land, one from which on the third day, he would spring forth again in victory. Dear Christians, your God has cared for you your entire life through. This, though, can be difficult to understand. There have been times you've doubted it, times it's been hard to believe. And if you do begin to ponder it properly, you're going to be disappointed, not in him, but in yourself. For the honest heart sees how you've let him down, how you don't deserve his love for you. So instead of looking for his love all over the place, I urge you to look instead for his infinite care and concern concentrated just in this little garden, his plan of salvation, your eternal life in Jesus' death and resurrection, the gospel. Look to Gethsemane and behold detail, beauty, devotion, and love beyond compare. And although your God's attention and care is amazing to see, there is a bit of longing behind it all, because the driving force of your Savior's garden work is a desire for all this care to spread across and to be known in a much wider field. So the God who desires that all men would be saved sends forth this gospel to the ends of the earth. He uses you for this work. By faith in Christ, God has retired you from a life of sin. And he's given you a retirement plan to fill your days. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. That's a tall order. I can't teach all nations. Can you? Oh, he knows this. Oh, so instead of the world, he gives you a unique retirement plan, asking you to labor in just one small garden as your very own. This is the family he has given you to care for, to water, tend, and raise in his word. It's the neighbor he's put in your life to forgive and love with delicate care. It's the church and synod he has joined you to so that the gospel may be proclaimed in this place and wherever else he carries us. Watching those retired farmers labor in their little gardens made me want to have one of my own, but I knew I could never have the passion and love that they did. Jesus' garden is different and far more powerful, for through his labor in Gethsemane, the Spirit of God comes and makes his passion and love yours in the forgiveness of sins. May his garden work inspire yours to love, to forgive, and to enjoy your little flock, just as God intends. Now the peace that passeth all understanding.
Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen.